Welcome to the Friday edition of Unexpected Points. We're going to review a wild Vikings Steelers Thursday night football game. A lot of takeaways from that. We're going to get into some issues of the week. I'm going to delve a little bit back more into a game that definitely has not been talked about enough. Of course, the Patriots Bills game. And then I'm going to come at you with my assessment of a few of the best bets for this weekend. And there, I got a big one. I got a big one, a very solid one here that people don't like, but sometimes those are the best bets. Anyway, let's get to it. All right, all right, everybody. Hope you uh, enjoyed the game last night. I am going to admit here that I went to bed. When in, not at halftime. That would be too early. Um, but I did make a calculated decision, an informed decision, an analytically based decision to go to sleep when it was 29 nothing in the third quarter, six minutes and 18 seconds left. The Vikings just hit a field goal. And at that point in time, according to PFF's win probability calculation, and again, the nerds, we almost got seriously dunked on last night. Well, not almost, but we were a few steps away. A touchdown, a conversion, and a win in overtime for the Steelers. We're a few steps away from getting seriously dunked on because everyone loves to dunk on the win probability numbers. Now, we did not have it at 99.9% or something like that, which if you have a poor model, that's probably what you would have had at that point in time. So we added a 98.6% chance that the Vikings were going to win there. 29-0, 6 left in the third quarter. And what's interesting about this game, now the big comeback happened. I'll get into the details, what drove that, everything else. But what's interesting about this at the very end of the game is, and this is kind of a mistake that people make generally where eight points is the most understood misunderstood point differential in the NFL, eight points, because it has a value, the value associated with it, especially very late in the game, like we're talking about in this circumstances. Even on the 12-yard line with one play to go, down eight points, quote-unquote one-score game, according to people. I think one-possession game is a more accurate term there. But anyway, one-score game. Our probability for the Steelers winning this thing is like is still a little bit under is under five percent. Actually, hadn't changed a, a ton from them being ninety eight point six percent midway through the third quarter, twenty nine nothing, to where the point that they were at right there. And why is that? Well, it's a pretty simple, intuitive calculation if you want to think about it. You need to convert that play. So, what's your probability of converting that play? We have that at about a 17% probability. It could be a little bit higher, but it's hard when you're compressed near the end zone on those types of plays. So on that particular one pass, needing a touch, and we had 17%, but let's say it's 20% to make it easy. So it's 20%. Then you need the two-point conversion. So the two-point conversion is basically a 50-50 shot for the NFL. That's what the conversion rate has been over the last few seasons, and I don't see any reason to dispute that. So then your win probability, very simple, 50-50, cut it in half. So now you're at 10% win probability. So 10% chance of scoring the touchdown and getting the two-point conversion. But now you need to go to overtime. And your chance of winning in overtime, while it's close to 50-50, it's slightly less than that because the Minnesota Vikings were seen as the better team. They were three-point favorites going into this game. So for argument's sake, for simplicity's sake, let's just say it's 50-50 again. Well, then you cut it from 10% to 5%. So pretty simple. If you think there's a 20% chance of converting that play in that circumstance from 12 yards out, then your chance of winning is roughly 5%. So that's why it was so low in that circumstance. Not a whole lot different than the 1.8% or whatever they had in the middle of the third quarter with plenty of time to go. And it just shows you that that eight points, the drama around that, there should be a lot of drama there because things can turn very quickly. If you get the touchdown and the two-point conversion, it's more of a time drama impact there. The the rapid, the rapidity, the rapidness, whichever word is correct, uh, of getting there can happen, but it was still a low probability event for the Steelers. Okay, let's talk about this up front. Let me, I, I, I didn't hit all the particulars on this game. So Pittsburgh, Minnesota, three-point favorite, which I mentioned. 
the final score, 36 to 28, so the eight-point victory that I mentioned. My adjusted scores, and I was shocked by this, and I think this may actually bring up a change that I should make in how I do all these adjustments based upon success rate, based upon the efficiency, down weightings of turnover-worthy plays that... I'm sorry, up weighting, turnover worthy plays that are not turnovers, down weighting, interceptions that are, aren't turnover worthy plays, and so on and so forth. I have lots of adjustments here. My final adjustment had it being basically 27 all, so a tie. And I think there are two things to this. One I'm going to mention later, which I think is a potential adjustment I need to make to my adjusted scores. I got to adjust the adjustment here for these scores and add an additional factor, which weighed heavily on this game just so you know, as contested catches, but I'll, I'll talk about it in more detail later. The second thing is, I think our feelings about this game illustrate very well, and this is almost like a, a back-to-school segment that I used to do during the offseason where I'm talking about these different concepts, and this is going to be a bias that we have here called the primacy effect. And just to tell you what the primacy effect is, uh, that definitionally, it's an individual's tendency to better remember the first piece of evidence or information they encounter than the information they receive later on, or the evidence they receive later on. So in other words, when if you flipped the two halves in this game, and of course there's an element of garbage time and soft defense, and that's the reason the Steelers were able to come back and so forth and so forth and so on. But if you flip the two halves in this game, you would probably think that the Steelers were the dominant team and the Vikings were lucky to get back into it instead of vice versa, right? Um, so it's that effect that we have where sometimes ran events happen in random order. It's not totally random in the NFL, of course. We're not flipping coins out there. The drives and how the defense and the offense are playing is influenced heavily by the game state, the situation, the score differential, how much time is left, all those sorts of things. So it's not random, but there is a higher degree of randomness to it than we're willing to acknowledge, which means that we shouldn't just say, oh, the Vikings dominated this game and the Steelers were lucky to even come so close just based upon the way that the scoring laid out. Steelers still had to go down and score all those touchdowns at the end of the game. It still happened. They still had to make plays. They still had to do it. We can't fully discount that sort of stuff. We'll discount it a little bit because it was at a lower win probability threshold, but I'm not going to fully discount it. Um, so Minnesota's probably, this is just a score is probably a little bit off because of that. Maybe there were a couple, a few points better, but not eight points better in this game, I don't think. And the, the main reason for that when you're looking at the non-adjusted numbers is the Steelers had a higher success rate offensively in this game. They had 44% success rate versus a 42% success rate for the Vikings. The Vikings had a ton of explosive run running plays, which for me, those get discounted more because they just don't happen that often. It's a little bit unlucky. You know, Dalvin Cook had 205 yards. Um, they had 242 total rushing yards. This was a 95th percentile type of game running the ball for the Vikings. And again, if we go to explosive runs, so these are runs of at least 10 yards in the game. Uh, I thought I had this number out here. But I think it was, I think they had 10 different runs that came into that category. Let me, I'm sorry, I gotta pull up this number. Explosive runs, I'm sorry, it's eight. So they had eight explosive runs in this game. That's a lot, that's at least 80 yards, boom. You're just getting right off of those of those runs. They had 149 rushing yards on explosive runs. So 100, 150 out of their 242 rushing yards were on these long, long runs. Impressive, you don't give them no credit for those, of course, but we're gonna downweight that a little bit and that also comes into play. Um, Big Ben finished with better numbers than Kirk Cousins in this game. So that's another reason why uh, we don't necessarily see this as def definitively a better performance for the Vikings. So Ben had positive EPA, only a tenth of a point per play. Uh, Kurt's Cousins was a negative two tenths of a point. And now some of that we need we adjust a little bit because the second, the first interception to Justin Jefferson, we did not credit as a turnover worthy play. Although, you know, it's in the middle of the field, is down in the middle of the field. That's the most common place you can have turnovers. The interception rates are much, much higher. They're three, four times higher in the middle of the field, down the field, than they are to other places in the field, to the rest of the field generally, compared to interception rates generally. They're much, much, much more common there. So maybe not the best place to throw it when you're, you know, up by, at that point, I think it would have been, what, 
29 to 7 or something like that. But anyway, you, you, you got to throw it. You can't, you can't just uh, put the brakes on everything. So we didn't credit that one with a turnover-worthy play, but we did credit the interception to Osborne. And so his grade in this game was only a 64 versus a 72 for Big Ben. So Big Ben had a bigger grade. And the thing bringing down the EPA, like I mentioned, the interception. So the two interceptions cost Kirk Cousins 12.3 expected points. That's a big one. Um, he missed a lot of passes early, though. So we didn't grade one of those as a turnover-worthy play. We only graded one as such. He had two big-time throws, which helped, but it was discounted by he had a number of misses, which could have been big, big plays earlier. The Vikings didn't – they weren't harmed that much by those misses early in the game because of the fact that they were so good running the ball. But they could have juiced it up a little bit more and maybe completely sealed the game instead. Okay, so the number of the game, and this goes back to – why I may need to make an adjustment to my adjusted scores, and that is 21.7. Now, 21.7 is the yards per reception the Steelers had on six contested catches that they made in this game. They were 6 of 10 in contested catches in this game. The Vikings were 0 for 5. They had 130 yards on contested catches for the Steelers, a touchdown, and they converted four first downs on those six contested catches versus, again, 0 for 5 for the Vikings. And only nine of the 130 yards that they got on these contested catches for the Steelers were after the catch. So these were bombs. These were, these were long air yard passes. And I know there's the term, the 50-50 ball, so a lot of these were 50-50 balls. So you'd say, okay, well, they completed 6 out of 10 instead of 5 out of 10. Let's face it. These are not 50-50 balls when you're tossing one up down the sideline like that. We're talking more like, I don't know, 20-80 balls, maybe 10-90 balls. This is, these are ones that are not going to be caught most of the time. And they were. And there's also a big uh, – there's defensive pass interference on a big one too that doesn't even show up here. It was on a similar type of play. So the reason I mention this is – these contested catches are, and I've, you know, you, 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 you complete passes way less often when it's a contested catch than when it's an open catch. I mean, it's not exactly uh, rocket science there. So there is a higher degree of variance to contested catches. So I probably should downweigh those, the results of those contested catches a bit more. And if we do that again, it would extend and, and you know, make the Vikings and my adjusted score a little bit better, maybe a four, four or five points better in this game. Not up to eight points, which it finished at. But again, it would expand it a bit more. And maybe I will implement that going forward. This was just a unique game in that contested catches played such a big role. The, the DPI is downweighted, but the contested catches are not as much as maybe what they need to be. And the pressure that the Vikings got was really incredible in this game. That's why I thought this was such an interesting dynamic. They had five sacks on Roethlisberger. We saw them coming with those double-A gap blitzes a, a lot. Roethlisberger only had a time to throw of two seconds flat. Extremely fast. He has the lowest average time to throw on the season at 2.3 seconds. So he was even faster in this game, yet he was sacked five times. So that shows you how ineffective the blocking was or effective the blitzing was, however you want to parse that out there. And another really interesting dynamic in this game from both teams, in my opinion, was the run and pass rates in these games. Now... If you look at the Steelers in this one, they're, they've been a pretty pass-happy franchise over the course of the last several years, not as much this year. They were actually 5% under expectation in their pass rate. Now, they passed the ball 66 67% of the time, but because they were down so much, we would have expected to go even further. But they stuck with the ground game, and it actually paid off for them a little bit here, which I was surprised by. Uh, Najee Harris had 94 yards on 20 carries, so that comes out to 4.7 yards per carry. Six first downs he converted. And if you look at their success rate, like on a percentile basis versus all other rushing games, they were it was a 64th percentile success rate. The Steelers have only had two other games this season where they've been over the 35th percentile. So this was a much, much, much better running game than what they typically have. And they leaned on it a little bit more than you would have expected, but they were just down so much they couldn't lean on it even more. Now, on the other hand, the Vikings had this incredible running game. They were 95th percentile, again, for how efficient they were running the ball. Yet, if you look at their pass rate, while it was under 50%, so you could say, oh, they ran the ball a lot. It was 49.3%. They ran the ball more than they did, more design runs than dropbacks. But 
it was less than 1% under expectation because they had such a huge lead. They actually passed it a decent amount in that second half, which I was surprised by. There were times like the Justin Jefferson interception, both interceptions, the other interception to KJ Osborne on third and five on the Pittsburgh side of the field, where I was surprised they were passing it so much. Now, Kirk did have some nice conversions, like the one to Dalvin Cook, where he needed it on a third down. But that, in particular, the one to KJ Osborne, third and five on the other side of the field. Not that much time left. I forget what there was, four or five minutes left to go. You could run in that circumstance, run the clock, number one, or, you know, because they weren't using timeouts yet at that point. So you could run, run the clock. If you don't pick up the fourth down, you can go for it and fourth down in those situations also and potentially get closer. And you really had difficulty stopping Minnesota. So I was a little surprised by how often they passed. It was one of those rare circumstances where, as an analytics guy, we probably take into account the win probability in those circumstances, seeing that 90% plus easily still at that point, uh, 95, 96% win probability at that point before the Osborne interception. We're seeing that and saying, you know what, let's not take too much risk here. Now we'll take some risk maybe going for it on fourth down because the gain that you're going to get from a punt is not necessarily going to be that great, although they did have a great punt, which they downed inside the five-yard line. Um, but you don't know that's going to happen, right? Uh, so we, we maybe would take some risk there, but we're not necessarily going to take risk where you could run clock in that circumstance and have this huge win probability. So that was an interesting wrinkle and an interesting decision there. Uh, there's not too much other to talk about on the decision front. You know, the go for it, go for two situations that the Steelers did, those were all appropriate. They're not a huge win probability gain when you go for two down, you know, 16, you kind of need to to do that sort of stuff. So it was good to see them do that. It was almost an obvious thing that they had to do in that circumstance. Um, but generally, now we'll, we got to take a step back and look at our win probability, our playoff probabilities now, our updated playoff probabilities based upon what happened in this game. So first, we're going to go to the Vikings. They're winners here. So the updated playoff probability is uh, 27, 28% now, where I think they were more like 20% before the game. So it went up a bit. Uh, not huge, but it did go up a bit. Now, if they can win this next game against the Bears, where they're at the Bears, it'll get them closer to 50% win probability, 45-50% win probability. So that'll be pretty huge. Uh, so the Vikings very much still in contention here. And, you know, they're 6-7, and seven, which is weird to have them in better contention now than the Steelers. This was almost a you need to win to make the playoffs type of game. Despite the fact the Steelers have a better record at 6-6-1, six, six, and one, they're down to a 10% win probability. I mean, sorry, playoff probability at this point versus, again, 25-30% for the Vikings. And they need a lot of wins here. So if the Steelers win out, let's say, they have Titans, Chiefs, Browns, Ravens. Oh, man, that's a killer. That is a killer, killer, killer schedule at the Chiefs and at the Ravens. Holy Lord. So the Steelers, if they win out, they'll make the playoffs. They'll, they'll be in if they win out. Um, if they win three out of four, let's say they lose to the Ravens, about 75% chance. If they win two out of these four games, it's more like a 40% 40, 40 chance. So still not that bad, actually. But the problem is even winning 50% of these games is pretty low probability for the Steelers because of the quality of the opponent. That's really the problem for them right now. And it kind of matters who they beat, too. Like, if they if they don't win the divisional games, they're, they're about 50-50. If they lose... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't doing this correctly. Actually, their playoff chances are much, much lower if they only win two games. I'm sorry. I did this totally incorrectly. I just, I just gave them two wins but no losses. So if I give them two wins, two losses, they don't make the playoffs. If I give them three wins, one loss, it's about a 50-50 chance. So they need to win three out of the four games against the Titans, Chiefs, Browns, and Ravens in order to make the playoffs. That's basically it. You got to win three out of four. And as of right now, we have that as a pretty unlikely scenario. That's why their playoff probability is only 10 after this game or less than 10 after this game. Okay, before we get into the topics of the week and then the best bets, it is time to talk about 
PFF subscriptions, you missed out on Cyber 40, but you know what? 25% off with promo code UNEXPECTED. That's right. Use promo code associated with this podcast. Get 25% off. Get all the great information that I'm putting out there, my quarterback rankings, my showdown uh, pieces, my DFS pieces, and then everything else that we're putting out on this site. We get all the projections that I deal with for fantasy and for props and everything else. And Greenline, of course, which is our betting service, which not only gives you information on uh, profitability we believe you would get from betting different sides and totals, but also shows the money that's going down on each side. It gives you a good rundown on the efficiency and the injuries for all these different games. All that available, 25% off. Promo code unexpected and also tells the the higher ups that you value what I'm doing here on this podcast. Second sponsor, Manscaped. Still here, still the Christmas season. They just launched their ultra premium body wash, a two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. It's time to give you or someone who needs it the gift of beautiful hair, skin, and balls this holiday season. Go to manscaped.com, use code PFF for 20% off and free shipping. You'll find the Performance Package 4.0, the Lawnmower 4.0. It's waterproof. You can use it in the shower. It has skin-safe technology to reduce cuts. They also launched, again, the new 2-in-1 shampoo and conditioner with key ingredients that include hydrating, nourishing, conditioning the scalp, and strengthening your hair at the same time. Tis the season to load up on Manscaped products, so get your dad, brother, friends, uncle, uh, neighbor, uh, PTA, board member, Get them the best gift of all, Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. 20% off and free shipping at PFF using code PFF at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use promo code PFF. Okay. You know what you guys need in your life? What we all need in our lives, and that's more Patriots, Bill's talk. But I think what happened was I did come to you on Tuesday. I did come to you after the Bills game, so... I probably should have, the Bills-Patriots game, I probably should have talked about more of this. But to be quite honest, I was putting together numbers quickly in the morning before I jumped on, and I was not aware at the level, the the, the low level, I should say, of discourse that was going to come out of this game. Not only for the brilliance of Belichick and the strategy of Belichick, but the self-flagellation that was going to be going on amongst, I don't know about Bill's fans necessarily, but Bill's media and Buffalo media for sure. Um, Those guys need to slow their roll a bit now, and I'll talk about that secondly. But let's talk about the strategy first. So I think the basic big picture point is how brilliant of a strategy was this from Bill Belichick? And this is what I'll say. This is why I'm going to frame it. I think Up front, what he did was he gave a higher floor, higher ceiling type of strategy, right? It's it was a extreme difference, extreme outcome as a run heavy game. And duh, they only dropped back the pass three times. But what they did in this, by not even allowing Mac Jones to ever throw the ball on third down to convert third downs, is they took away a lot of the upside, which even comes with the run heavy strategy. If you look at what they would have wanted to accomplish with this strategy. Let's assume you say you run the ball effectively and you're efficient offensively. Well, they scored 14 points. And one of those scores was a 64 yard touchdown run, which that plus the two point conversion led to more than half of those points. So they weren't that efficient, really. Um, But again, the conditions, all that stuff. But yeah, but you just lowered your ability to be efficient in this game. You had a good running game. You had about as good of a running game as you could have hoped for under those conditions with the other team knowing you're going to run it all the time and you still only scored 14 points. So there's that. Number two, you say you do this running game to, you know, control the clock. Well, their time of possession in this game was 32 minutes. So they were two minutes over a perfect split in this game. So they didn't even really accomplish that. They didn't really accomplish controlling the clock because six of their nine drives, they took a less than two minutes and 15 seconds off the clock. They were just punting. They were three and outing so much on this game that it wasn't really an effective means of controlling the clock. If you really wanted to control the clock, the running game allows you to do that by having long drives, drives with a high number of plays, but you need to convert to do that. You need to convert those third downs. They would have had a much better chance of doing that more often if with some strategic passing in there. Again, not passing all the time, but a few strategic passes. 
Uh, this was not a good offensive performance for the Bills. So another way to think about this is what had to go right for the Patriots to win this game. And I know you don't want to, you know, harp. You, know, you own your results. You don't say it was luck. People don't like talking about that. But again, let's look at what went wrong for the Patriots and what went right for the Patriots in this game. So what went wrong for the Patriots? Well, we had the Nikhil Harry drop on the punt. And that led to eventually the Bills, who had to still score the touchdown, scoring a touchdown. So that's a big what went wrong there. Now, as a caveat to that what went wrong, and we're talking about the brilliance of Bill Belichick and the strategy here, what was the strategy behind probably the worst decision of the game, which was the fact that Nikhil Harry was even back there to return the punt in the first place? Zero career NFL punt returns before that play for Harry. He returned 14 punts in his entire career. And his, remember, he played for Arizona State. He's not like I am played for you know Iowa or uh, Michigan or Ohio State or someplace where you might have been in the whipping winds and frosty conditions. You know, he gets to practice it during the week, I assume, some and so forth and so and so on. But that was probably the biggest strategic blunder, like objective strategic blunder of the entire game, and that was Belichick making that strategic blunder. But again, it was unlucky. What was the other unlucky thing? Well, the other big one you can point to for the Patriots is the personal foul that happened on the Josh Allen run. Bad, hurt them. The 15 yards hurt them. The conversion hurt them. But it would have been fourth and less than one yard. So, you know, they probably convert that anyway. Not 100% of the time, but I think with Josh Allen, you know, sneaking it or running it, you convert that 75% of the time, 80% of the time anyway. So those are the two main things. Now let's talk about what went right for the Patriots, and we're going to weigh these versus each other. So what went right for the Patriots? So if you count the, the muffed punt as a fumble, there were three fumbles in that game. The Bills got that one. There were two other fumbles. Patriots got both of those fumbles. They got a fumble from the Bills when, when Breida fumbled it, and they fumbled it themselves on a, a toss play, I believe in uh, running the ball, but they recovered their own fumble. So that went right for them. They got two out of three fumbles. Not bad. 64-yard uh, touchdown run, as we mentioned, the longest touchdown run they've had in 10 years. Again, you're going to hope for a big play like that, but counting on it would be foolish. Uh, there were two drives that the Bills had where they got down first and goal from the six-yard line and first and goal from the 13-yard line. Those drives ended with zero points. Zero points on those two drives. Now, you could have hoped to keep them out of the end zone on both of those two drives, but the fact that they had zero points is very, very lucky. And, you know, there are all these drops for the Bills, including that big drop for Stefan Diggs, but I'm gonna, not really going to count those because the weather conditions, it was hard. It, like, you can't expect guys to make those types of plays, but if you want to throw that in a little bit. So I think all the good things that happened for the Patriots far outweighed the bad luck type of element things that happened for the for the Patriots. And because of that, that's why my adjusted scores had the Bills as being the better team in this. They only won by four points with all these things going, more things going right for the Patriots than going wrong. So Belichick gave his team some breathing room. They gave his team a chance to win, but I don't think you could say with this brilliant, brilliant strategy that he gave his team the best chance to win. He gave his team a chance to win. And for that reason... Again, let's give him credit for what he did. It worked. We acknowledge that. But I don't think it was even a good strategy necessarily, let alone a brilliant strategy. Okay. Now let's talk about the meltdown in Buffalo because I think this is the other interesting point that people have gone nuts on on here. Of course, there was the question posed to the safeties by an older journalist there in Buffalo about whether or not they were embarrassed by the performance. And then there was this meltdown based upon Sean McDermott saying that he was he was not going to give Bill, Bill, Bill Belichick too much credit. Now, people saw that as being extremely salty, but the question that he was asked was whether or not, like, his feelings about the psychological component of playing Bill Belichick. That's the actual question. And as part of that answer, he said, whether it's Bill or anybody else, they beat us. So again, he's just saying that the fact that it is specifically Bill Belichick there's no psychological edge or component or extra thing that happened other than what happened on the field. And he mentioned a lot of the lucky or unlucky type of plays that I mentioned. Now, maybe you shouldn't have mentioned that. 
Maybe it seems a little salty to do that. That's fine. But the question was, in my opinion, I'm not saying this is like the reporter is a bad reporter, but in my question is kind of a little bit Bush League type of question there to ask someone about the psychological c- component because there's a there's an implication there. And it's unsurprising that the same reporter who asked that question, of course, these reporters are often just asking the question to set up their articles. They're not like trying to get insight necessarily from those questions. Uh, he wrote an article the next day that said, in the Patriots' latest win over the Bills, Bill Belichick, this is the title, Bill Belichick shows he's living in Sean McDermott's head. That's uh, it's quite a claim there. He's living in Sean McDermott's head. Um, and again, that's the same reporter who asked about the psychological component and, of course, quotes that in there. What's funny is he doesn't really give any examples of why he's living in or how or what evidence you have of him living in Sean McDermott's head other than the fact that he was, quote unquote, outcoached in this game, even though he specifically mentions the fact that Nikhil Harry was back for the, the punt and how that was a bad move. So if anything, that was the worst objective strategic decision of the game from Belichick. And in addition to that, additional context about the where exactly Bill Belichick is residing in Sean McDermott's head I mean, the Bills were 2-0 and against the Patriots last season, including a 29-point win in their second game. And they were 0-2 in 2019, which is true, but both of those games they lost by less than one score. And that was a, game, that was a season where the Patriots were on fire that season, although they trailed off near the end of the season and you know lost to the Titans in the playoffs. So there's really not much evidence here from the that the Sean McDermott's, you know, that Bill Belichick's living in their head, that they're embarrassed, they had such a poor outcome. So what I will say is, and I'm going to quote my favorite man, Aaron Rodgers, when it comes to Bills and Bills fans, R-E-L-A-X. Relax, Buffalo. You're still the second best team in the NFL, according to my numbers, according to the betting markets right now. Yes, it's less likely you're going to get the number one seed. Yes, you're less likely to win the division. And yeah, there's a door open, a slight creak in a door open that maybe if things go extremely wrong the rest of the season, you won't even make the playoffs. But the odds are very much in your favor to make the playoffs. And the Bills really have a chance this week against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to not only flip around this narrative, to flip around. We could go from Bills are in disarray to Bills are now back potentially going to win the division if they can beat the Patriots. You can flip around that narrative and you can put yourself on a hot streak, on a winning streak going into the playoffs with a fundamental team that is not troubled by injuries, that is not troubled by poor play, that had some unlucky things happen, but is very well positioned to make a Super Bowl run this year. Okay. Uh, One other thing I'm going to talk about here that I did not talk about in the Tuesday show because I didn't want to get into it with so many games to review, and that is Joe Brady. He gone from Carolina. And the reason I want to talk about this is the Panthers have been on my radar since Matt Rule got there. David Tepper, the owner, is a little bit on my radar also. Because from day one, they have taken a impatient, what I will say, approach to team building. Remember, They were a depleted team going into 2020. They had not much. They let Cam Newton go. They bring in Teddy Bridgewater for a big contract, which they had to end up not only trading him away, but eating a bunch of that contract. They bring in Robbie Anderson on a big deal. They draft all defensive players in the draft, which I thought was kind of funny. They take Derek Brown in the top 10, who played pretty well as a rookie. He's been okay this season. But again, we're talking about a defensive tackle in a draft that had tons of high-end offensive tackle talent, which is not only more valuable, but maybe a little bit more difficult to to replace and to find in drafts that other teams were clamoring for. Um, Not to mention the fact, I guess they could have tried to move up and get one of the quarterbacks. So there's that, showing a little bit of a weird defensive gist to it. But they had that impatience. And then we turn to the next offseason. They offered the number eight pick for Matthew Stafford, reportedly, maybe even additional picks. When turned down there, then they traded, you know, uh, picks, including a second rounder for Sam Darnold. 
They exercise immediately exercise the guaranteed fifth year option for Darnold, which so they're on the hook for 18, 19 million next year. And then with this Cam Newton recent Cam Newton move, you know he got more guaranteed money for half a season with the Panthers than he did for two different contracts with the Patriots. Now the Patriots let him go because they didn't give him a lot of guaranteed money on that second contract, but still they were able to have him signed, you know, pen to paper for less guaranteed money for two full seasons worth what would have been two full seasons than the Panthers are giving up for half a season. And this move here can really just be framed as, a, in my opinion, an additional co- consolidation of power for, for Matt Rule. There's some talk of some hot seatedness for him. I don't buy it, but when you're David Tepper, the owner, you're a new owner, you're an impatient dude, you're the richest owner in the NFL worth, I don't know how much it is, somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 billion, despite the fact that you gave him an extremely lucrative and long-term uh, contract, making him one of the highest paid coaches in the NFL, despite no experience, you can write that off pretty easily. And it's not exactly going to make a dent in your wallet. So there is some possibility from that perspective. But if you think about rule here, Joe Brady was the one person high up in that organization that was without his influence. He was in charge and kind of handpicked Scott Fritterer, the GM who came in this last year. So he consolidated there. Uh, his defensive coordinator is Phil Snow, who's been with him for eight years. Was with him for eight years before joining the Panthers in 2020. He was there at Baylor and at Temple, and now the new offensive coordinator for the Panthers, Jeff Nixon, has known Matt Rule for 30 years. They were best friends and teammates in high school. Uh, they spent a couple of years together in college and were roommates at Penn State. He was the co-offensive coordinator at Baylor with Rule before coming to the Panthers as an offensive assistant last year with Matt Rule, and now he moves into that seat. So he has probably the two closest people to him professionally. Uh, Joe Brady was the only one who wasn't close to him professionally. He has those two guys sitting as offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, and he has a GM who he was able to have a high influence, if not hand pick, coming in. That's a lot of power for rule. And the whole question of did they run or not, did they not run run or not, uh, we'll find that out going forward. We'll see how that works. But for me, I think those are important points is to look at rule in can he be comfortable working with someone who he doesn't feel like he has that degree of loyalty? Is loyalty the most important thing here? Or should it be competence? Should it be bringing in new ideas? Should it be not just leaning on these working relationships But should it be trying to diversify and have an understanding with new and different smart people who are going to have independence also in their ability to question whoever's on top? I think a lot of these things could end up being a mistake. We'll see how it plays out here. But again, it's another sign of impatience for this team. And this is a team that is going to have to make more decisions this offseason on what they do at the quarterback position, because I don't think Cam Newton is a long-term option and Sam Darnold, while they have him under contract, he has clearly lost a lot of the shine that they had, that Brady was able to do something for him last season. Um, And they really just need to fix things here, especially the offensive line, if they want to have a proper evaluation of the quarterback. And in some ways, they would have had a a proper evaluation of the offensive coordinator, which they were not able to have this last season. What's going to happen with Joe Brady? Probably going to have to take another coordinator position or potentially a head coaching position in college. I don't think he's going to be in line to get a NFL head coaching job, despite the fact that this is a guy who I believe either formally or informally talked to three different teams about head coaching positions this last offseason. So it's a little bit of a fall from grace from him, but I'm not sure how much of this rubs off on him when the front office and Matt Rule, of course, are going to be the primary decision makers when it comes to things like bringing in Sam Darnold and not fixing that offensive line. Okay, let's move on to the best bets for the week. But before we do that, a very appropriate sponsor here, DraftKings Football Fans. I'm sure we all love an action-packed, high-scoring NFL game, but with the latest no-brainer from DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, you'll be a winner. Once a single point is scored, new customers who bet just $1 on any team to score can win $100 in free bets. It's that simple. The Sportsbook... If the sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you can get 
in on the NFL action with daily fantasy, huge cash prizes every week. DraftKings is giving all new customers a free shot at a million dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code PFF. $1 on any team to score one point. You win $100 in free bets. If they score, you win with promo code PFF at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only, new customers only, minimum $5 deposit and $1 wager required, one per customer. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. And also Western and Southern. Let's talk about life insurance. Want a chance to win the ultimate game day feast, whether it's football success or financial savvy, winning starts with asking us, meaning Western and Southern, questions. Would you like to know what it's like behind the scenes with Al on Sunday Night Football? So this is for Chris Collinsworth here. How about a need to know for your financial future? Western and Southern is teaming up with PFF's very own Chris Collinsworth to share insights that can help you get ahead on your fantasy and financial scoreboards. Every submission earns you a chance to win the ultimate feast to celebrate football's favorite Sunday. We'll cover your catering up to $2,500, coordinate your order from a restaurant near you, and have it delivered on February 13th, 2022. And don't forget to check out the Chris Collinsworth podcast and Western and Southern's Instagram for answers to the best questions each week. Submit your questions at westernandsouthern.com slash askchris. One more time, that's westernandsouthern.com slash askchris. If you're watching on YouTube, check out the link in the description below. Remember, with Western and Southern, you can rest assured on game day. Okay, let's get back to the bester betters. And, okay, number one here. This is the only true best bet of the week in a similar way to Buffalo minus two and a half, which of course lost was the only true best bet of the week, the the week prior. And we're going straight back to Carolina. We're going back to Carolina here, Carolina Panthers minus two and a half at, I'm sorry, at home versus the Atlanta Falcons. There's going to be some negative sentiment around this one. I understand that. Um, And if you look at the line here, I see, actually, I see a two available now. Let's go ahead and lock that in at two then. So you can get plus two at, I'm sorry, minus two at bet MGM. It's kind of interesting because it's minus two at bet MGM, but then minus two and a half at DraftKings is actually juiced the other direction. So let's get the minus two there. Uh, A couple of guards are injured for the Panthers, so that hurts. Obviously, no Christian McCaffrey, so that hurts everything else so far this season. But, you know, their defense is legit, and that offensive line is not holding up for Matt Ryan recently. And if you look at the success rate, right, for the defense here, total defense success rate is third in the NFL for the Panthers. They've been up and down, but generally they've been really, really good. And the total success rate for the Falcons defense is 31st. They just can't generate pressure. And I think that's very, very important when Carolina's Achilles heel this season has been their inability to pass block with this offensive line. The Falcons had a 7% pressure rate against Tom Brady last week, the lowest pressure rate in the NFL for any game this season. So that's a big one. That is a very big one. Um, That time is going to give them, and they're coming off of a bye also for the Panthers, so hopefully they can fix some of the issues going on there. That gives them a little bit of a bump in my projections, the fact that they're going off of a bye, whereas, you know, obviously the Falcons played last week. And if we look at the teams, the way they've played so far this year, there isn't a whole lot of difference here. I mean, I think the big thing would be that, you know, Matt Ryan has had an okay grade at 63.6. He has, in, on occasion, been able to produce passing the ball so far this year. But I think generally, there's just not enough juice. There's not enough pass protection for him to be able to extend this game. I know CPAT, seemingly the MVP of the league, is going to be playing and everything else. But I still think it's not going to be quite enough. And I expect a lot of running. And they should be able to run the ball very effectively and very strong against a Falcons defense, which is right now 26 in the NFL in their run success rate, in their opponent success rate against the run. So this is going to be a big, hopefully easy cover here. Again, minus two is what I'm taking at bet MGM here, but that's going to be one of the, that's going to be my main, main best bet here. Now, secondary best bet is, I'm still going to, I'm going to classify this one as a best bet, is the 
Tennessee Titans versus the Jackson, Jacksonville Jaguars. It was eight and a half. I think like it might have moved up to nine, so that's unfortunate. But let me let me check to see if we can still get an eight and a half here. Um, sorry for the delay. Where did it go? I should have checked this right beforehand. Um, no, you can still get eight and a half. You can get eight and a half. If, again, our friends bet MGM eight and a half. So we're going to lock that in at eight and a half. Uh, you even have eight at DraftKings Sportsbook, but you got it's minus 115. So if I wanted to cheat, I could say eight here at minus 115. But why don't we just say eight and a half at Bet MGM? So minus eight and a half. I mean, again, another team coming off of a buy. Julio Jones should be back. The Jaguars, the thing about the Jaguars, and maybe they'll get a backdoor cover here, but the Jags have only scored. I've never scored more than one touchdown in the fourth quarter. They had a touchdown and a two-point conversion for eight points. Even in games that they've been getting blown out by 20 points, teams have been scoring 30-something points against them consistently. They don't, they don't backdoor anyone. They don't come back on anyone. They never get more than a touchdown. Most of the time, it's either eight, seven, three, or zero points. They've had multiple games where they get zero points in the fourth quarter, despite the fact that they're trailing the entire time. The Jaguars have not scored more than 20 points in almost a couple of months now. So you could look at that and say eight and a half, that's a lot of points against a defense that's been playing okay. But again, Tennessee's at home. And if the ceiling for the Jaguars offense is 20 points, you know, the, and, and the Jaguars, and the, and the Tennessee Titans defense has been legitimately good. They're getting pressure. They have a good back end there. If the ceiling is 15, 20 points for them, we don't need a juggernaut offensive performance from the the Titans, even under an optimistic scenario for the Jaguars in order to get this cover. So it gives us different ways to, to get an out here. You could shut down totally the Jaguars offense and get a cover with a mild offensive performance for the Titans, or even if they hit close to what's their ceiling they've been displaying this year, you only need maybe 25 points from the Titans offense in order to get that. And they just need to cut down on the turnovers. That's really been the problem, cutting down on those turnovers. I think they're going to be they rushed the ball effectively, finally, when they played against the Patriots uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, again, fixing things up, being able to figure out more of what's going on post by with this team getting healthy with their receivers, getting more used to not having to shuffle in all these new players. I think that is going to be the key, key, key. And, again, the Jaguars are just really, really bad. They're in that Lions – Texans sort of tier. Texans being the worst, of course, but they're in that Lions-Texans sort of tier here. Um, looking at all my different numbers, I would have this more like 11 points as opposed to, like I said, eight and a half. So that's the, that's a pretty big difference. And to go back to Carolina-Atlanta, I had that more like six points as opposed to two and a half. And okay, that's it for me for the, the best bets. If you want to know some other leans here, I have a lean on the Washington football team plus four and a half against Dallas. And there is a, a little bit of a lean for the Bears. God, 12 and a half point underdogs at home woo, against uh, the Packers. I'm not sure, according to my numbers, and maybe this is why I have a little bit of a lean and I shouldn't here. I'm not quite sure, according to my numbers, whether or not Fields is actually better or worse than Andy Dalton. Dalton had that horrific performance last week, but only... Th- one out of the four interceptions were graded as turnover-worthy plays. I think it's worse to have Fields, who's going to play. But you never know. Um, at least, I'm sorry, it's on the road. This is in Green Bay. But there's some chance that he can perform well. So I, I'd probably stay away from this one. But at least straight numbers-wise, that does also come out as being a lean in this game. All right, thanks everybody for tuning in, listening to the best bets, listening to my rants, listening to the Thursday night wrap up. Go ahead, rate, review the pod. Uh, get ready for Tuesday when I come back at you with a wrap up with all my adjusted numbers for you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can also shoot me a note on Twitter at Kevin Cole PFF. Otherwise, have a great weekend and I'll talk to you again next week.